forces broke the arms of an elderly news dealer this afternoon when he refused to share his week's receipts with them. Stacks of newspapers were tossed in the gutter as the thugs wrecked the business and made their getaway. Lunchtime crowds were paralyzed by the suddenness of the crime. Not a hand was raised in protest. It's been a little while since I reviewed a classic movie, huh? What was the last one? I've done some newer stuff here and there, but the more retro classic stuff was probably Halloween H2O, I believe, October 2022. Here's what I would like to do. I would like to bring these back regularly on the channel, just like all my lore content, but it really depends on interest. If you guys clicked on this video and you're enjoying it and want more of it, please let me know in the comments below so I can determine the future of this series. Today we're going to review a childhood classic of mine. Yes, copper. You dumb dick. You silly, stupid cop. Dick Tracy. You are probably going to hear me say the word dick a lot in this review. There's no way to avoid it. The live action movie based on the crime comic strip of the 1930s. And who is Dick Tracy? He's a hard-boiled, tough-as-nails police detective out to stop the criminals of the city, and he's simply unstoppable. He's equipped with a particular set of skills that make him so dangerous, such as running, <music> climbing ladders and jumping over obstacles, And he's impervious to bullets as they simply whiz right by him as he stands perfectly still. It's so good. It's one of those classic movies that you just don't see today. It's the definition of they don't make them like they used to. At least not in the way that this one was made. Before we get started on the review, I'd like to express a huge thank you and shout out to all of my Patreon members for your continued support. You guys help make this channel possible and contribute to keeping these videos flowing. If you'd like to have your name up here too, gain exclusive benefits like sneak peeks at upcoming content, detailed progress updates, behind the scenes content, access to the Discord exclusive channel, and early access to videos, go to patreon.com forward slash gamerthumbtv or click the link in the description to get started. Now back to Dick, Dick Tracy. If you grew up in the early 90s like me, you probably remember this era very well, where these huge movies felt like these major events. They were marketed everywhere in different forms, especially to kids. And Dick Tracy wasn't any different. For a time, the movie was everywhere, but it was very short-lived. It was one of those movies that there was a small era where it was relevant, and then nobody cared anymore, just vanished. It didn't become this big mega franchise like so many others did. And if you ask kids today, hey, what's Dick Tracy? They're going to have no idea what you're talking about. They're going to stare at you cluelessly. But back in the 80s and 90s, marketing companies knew how to grab the attention of our uh, younger selves. The 1989 Batman movie served as the inspiration for Dick Tracy's marketing campaign. If you wanted to score big money, you had to market these movies to kids. Because we were the ones getting our parents to spend all the money on this stuff. And Batman did that with cereal, toys, video games, everything. If you were a kid during that era, Batmania was in full effect. It could not be avoided. Disney spared no expense to copy that same formula with Dick Tracy. A ton of tie-in material was created, including a toy line consisting of 14 different action figures manufactured by Playmates toys with bizarrely shaped bodies, a bunch of games, they had Tiger Electronics LCD versions, including those crappy little wristwatch LCD games, the infamous NES version, there was also a Game Boy version, among others, and a Sega version that was really cool, more of an arcade style shooter. There was a prequel, three issue comic comic book tie-in called Dick Tracy, The Complete True Hearts and Tommy Gunn's Trilogy. There was a novel that went through several changes and it released before the movie. And of course, McDonald's entered the fray with a cross promotion. There's more than one way to win cash in McDonald's Dick Tracy Crime Stopper game. Give it up, prune face. Collect the mobsters from your game cards and watch for their ugly mug shots each week at McDonald's. Make a match and you can make a million. Aha! Uh -huh. There's the old pucker puss. We solved that case without a wrinkle. <laughs> we? Dick Tracy, the 
movie is only in theaters. I'm ripping them out. Game is only at McDonald's. I meant it when I said Dick Tracy was everywhere. And the Disney produced movie in the 90s was definitely going to have a theme park attraction. Dick Tracy took the form of a live stage show called Dick Tracy starring in Diamond Double Cross and it actually had some really catchy music. Originally, Dick Tracy wasn't even going to be a Disney movie. There had been a concept for it since 1975, and it had been bouncing between different creators and different studios up until its creation. At one point, also involving Universal Pictures, Steven Spielberg, and Clint Eastwood. At some point, Warren Beatty was approached to play Dick Tracy, and creative differences began appearing in the early drafts of the script. Universal early on wanted to make a darker, grittier version of the movie, a violent film set in the 1920s during the Prohibition era. But Warren Beatty happened to be a big fan of the Dick Tracy comic strips, and after contract negotiations fell through, he decided to option the rights to the movie for $3 million. Then he took it to Disney, with a script written by Jim Katz and Jack Epps, and Warren Beatty became both the director of the movie and the starring role. We almost had a Dick Tracy movie releasing under the traditional Walt Disney banner, but it is a story about crime and mobsters, so they decided to release it under the more adult-oriented Touchstone Pictures label. Still a Disney production. Warren Beatty's version of the movie was very much modeled after Dick Tracy creator Chester Gould's comic strips, and it was heavily stylized. It takes place in a crime-infested city in 1938, and the city itself looks amazing. There's no CGI in this movie at all. In an era where CG was starting to take off and movie studios were looking for a reason to use it, the backdrops of the city were bright, they were colorful, well-lit paintings. I wish movies still did this instead of just CGing everything, there was some real unique skill involved in this sort of filmmaking to create the illusion that these live actors are living and interacting in this world. And it looks very artificial, which that is a style on its own. Like this shot where this kid's running by a train. To film the scene they used about 150 feet of real train track. The train itself was just a small scale model, as was common during the time. And the area around it was a matte painting. It looks great, and the very saturated and limited color palette of the movie helps create its unique look. You can count on your hands how many different colors appear in Dick Tracy. Warren Beatty decided on a color palette consisting of seven colors, and they all had to appear as the exact same shade. I much prefer this overall appearance than that violent, gritty look that we might have gotten, much more than like a black and white Sin City kind of thing. Even the camera work used very subtly makes the movie look like a comic book. Much of the filming was focused on making scenes look like they were all happening within a, a single frame, without panning the camera around left to right, like in a comic book where you have a rectangular panel that contains all the action and nothing exists outside his borders. That was all done purposely to evoke that comic book feel without being too obvious at the same time. And the makeup work is outstanding, one of the best aspects of the movie. All of Dick Tracy's villains happen to look like ugly monsters. Some of these used to scare me when I was a kid. Although they're regular humans, they're not mutants or anything. They're just ugly dudes. This is a result of Dick Tracy being a faithful representation of the original comic strip. The bad guys all had exaggerated features and their entire identities basically revolve around their most superficial features. Some of the most hilarious being the brow, who happens to have this enormous squished forehead with multiple rolls, and little face, whose face happens to be this tiny little thing plastered across a huge head. It's both hilarious and horrifying. There's so many different characters, some having larger roles than others, some only appearing briefly, but all of them having quality prosthetic work. Prune face has this decrepit, droopy looking face. Flat top, his head at the top is obviously flat. Lips manless is one of the most disgusting. Take a wild guess at what lips distinguishing feature is. If you guessed his lips, then you're paying attention. And he uses them to devour his food disgustingly. You mind if I leave? What? I get sick when you eat. You didn't use them. One of the most entertaining ones is Mumbles, and he's one of the very few that look mostly normal, but nobody can understand him because when he talks, he mumbles. I know you want to do it. Don't do it. I like it. I don't like it. I do. 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 I do
Mumbles. Where's Lips Manless? Here go. Here go. Here go. Okay, you heard him, Mrs. Green. That's his testimony. Okay, boys, get him out of here. Is what? But the star of the show here when it comes to Dick Tracy's villains is Al Pacino as Big Boy Caprice. He went through several different appearances before they decided on his final look, and Al Pacino had a big say in it. He helped improvise the character's final design. His makeup took almost four hours to apply, and under all that makeup, he brought his A-game to the role. This man gave 110%. He was even nominated for an Oscar for his big boy Caprice character. Every time he's on screen, he's hilariously entertaining. He's oddly shaped, kind of like the penguin, and he's incredibly obnoxious to everyone around him. He's always making demands, always screaming at someone, yelling about every little thing. Show it! Move it! Touch it! Touch it! I want it! Touch it! Grab it! Let's go! Hey, got a match? What was that all about? My income tax. Hey! Oh, 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 I'm about to turn this dump into the birthplace of a new era in entertainment! You're telling me it's 2 a.m. Ah, hey! That was a silly thing to do. He's the best piano player in town. Shut up! I'm sure coming off Scarface in the 80s really helped him nail his role and craft the character into who he was. This demanding, angry mob boss that has outbursts every two seconds, but at the same time, there's a lot of humor in the character. He's got all these nervous tics and he loves walnuts. It's a thing. He just loves walnuts and he leaves scraps all over the place. And for some reason, he's always quoting random historical figures when it benefits him. Walnuts. Walnuts like walnuts, don't you, big boy? I love them. A lot of people like walnuts. They're good for the liver. Yeah, but they're bad for the brain. You're sloppy, big boy. You're under arrest. This Tracy character is unstable. The city should get rid of him. I mean, if you don't get rid of him first. Who said that? Law without order is as great a danger to the people as order without law. Jefferson. Big Boy Caprice is the main bad guy in the story, mostly. There's also this other mysterious figure that has to do with a major plot twist that's hiding in the shadows, playing all sides, called The Blank. And why is this character called The Blank? Well, because their face is blank. They're described as a man without a face that kind of sounds like Cobra Commander. Grab it, Big Boy. Get your hands up, Tracy. Don't move, either one of you. The Blank tries to mess with Dick Tracy and plays his, or her, cards right in an attempt to frame him for killing the city's corrupt DA, and Big Boy becomes a victim of the Blank shenanigans too when he's framed for kidnapping Dick Tracy's gal. This is where the humor really shines, just well written comedy that's naturally part of the plot without being in your face constantly telling you it's time to laugh. Big Boy's being framed for kidnapping her so Dick Tracy can go arrest him for a federal crime. Big Boy doesn't even know she's there, he has no idea this poor woman's captured, and he's getting blamed for it. Then while yelling that he's being framed, he actually commits the crime of kidnapping while complaining about it nonstop. It's so funny. What's she doing here? It won't budge, Tracy. What is this? It's Tracy's day. What's she doing here? How's she, how's she doing here? Okay, Tracy. It's kidnapping, big boy. It's a federal offense. Things are not always what they seem. Find the records. Lock all the doors. This is your fault. They're forcing me to use you as a hostage. Pain can be valuable, Mr. Hart. We learn from pain. We learn, but don't make me push you! This is awkward. This is so awkward. Here. They say I kidnapped you. I didn't kidnap you, but I'm kidnapping you now. Oh, this life in a good heart. So many questions, so few answers. It's very stupid of you to have been lured into this scheme. A big mistake. The entire story of Dick Tracy basically boils down to a constant back and forth struggle between Dick Tracy and Big Boy Caprice. Big Boy takes over Lip's nightclub, then in his scene I can't help but think the Dark Knight was inspired by. Big Boy calls a meeting with all the mob bosses. Very Joker-like, he knows Dick Tracy's a problem, he wants to form this big criminal enterprise with him at the top, and at least Big Boy does seem kind of friendly and understanding about the whole thing. If you don't want to join him, no sweat, right? I'm out. <clears throat> It only works if we're all in. 
Let him go, let him go. It's still a free country. Maybe you'll have a change of heart. Come on, Tracy, get off that building. If they get you, they got a perfect right to do whatever they want. Dick Tracy goes after Big Boy's goons over and over in an attempt to find evidence to finally put him away for good. And in classic villain fashion, Big Boy has so many chances to kill him, but he doesn't. At one point, he attempts to bribe him and fails. Instead of just having him shot and be done with it, he creates this elaborate trap straight out of a cartoon where Dick Tracy's tied up and the building's gonna explode if he doesn't get out in time. Of course he does. Dick Tracy's trying to end this crime wave all while being tempted by a seductress. You may remember Madonna was a big deal back then and she She's an important character in the movie, playing a performer in Big Boy's club called Breathless. She's the temptress character that Dick Tracy tries to get to testify against Big Boy, but she's constantly trying to seduce him to get Dick thinking with his... his dick. Dick Tracy isn't alone though. He also has a sort of sidekick, this homeless parentless kid that he rescues, called Kid, until he chooses the name Dick Tracy Jr. So creative. I love this kid, he's such a little shit. Peppermint. Tricep. You know, Tracy, for a tough guy, you do a lot of pansy things. We got a place for people who beat up kids. This cockroach or old man? Go suck it. Did Dick Tracy first meet him when he steals some guy's watch? Then he takes him in, but the kid refuses to go to a children's home. He wants nothing to do with it. He'd rather be homeless out in the wild. So Dick Tracy's stuck with this kid and he doesn't know what to do with him. Then he just pawns him off for a while to his girlfriend, Tess Trueheart. I'm on my way. Hey, Tracy, what about the eating machine? Huh? Oh. Can you watch him or something? Watch him do what? Uh... You two married? No. Would you like a broken arm? I don't like days. Good. Me neither. And since the kid's a street urchin, he starts really digging this new life of being able to afford things. And he's constantly asking for food. Every two seconds, he's wondering when this next meal. Get out of here! The young man will be out in a moment, I presume. All right, when do we eat? Live alone and like it, free as the birds in the tree. When do we eat? High above the briars, live alone and like it, I do whatever I please. When do we eat? When my heart desires, free to hang around or fly. When do we eat? Only the murmuring breeze. When do we eat? As an obligato, live alone and like it. Why is that such a cry? Free to go the two. Free to say about. And Dick Tracy may be a hardened detective, but he does have a soft spot for the kid, and he's a loving, faithful boyfriend. Until Madonna shows up, and he has a hard time expressing any sort of emotion. But Tess Trueheart sticks with him through thick and thin, even suffering a kidnapping and almost getting her head crushed by machinery. There's something so special about this movie. It's both a great mob crime film, but goofy and cartoony at the same time, without being completely over the top like something like Batman and Robin. Warren Beatty nailed that feel of a 1930s comic on screen, as if the characters were just transported into the real world. And it really is a shame that this movie is not talked about more today. Maybe it would have been if it became this major multi-movie franchise, but perhaps it is better just having this one as a lone 90s classic. If you haven't watched it yet, do yourself a favor and pick up a cheap copy online. Re-experiencing this movie as a child versus viewing it as an adult is a totally different experience where now we can sort of appreciate the filmmaking that went into putting this together. And once again, if you enjoyed this review and would like me to do more of these in the future, please let me know in the comments below. That's the review of Dick Tracy. I'll catch you guys later. Wait. I'm having a thought. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm gonna have a thought. It's coming. It's gone.